Thank you. So uh, I want to begin with a little exercise in imagination. I want you guys to imagine, if you can, what a huge scandal it might be if the New York Times discovered that the CEO of Google had been quietly paying $40,000 a year directly towards the salary of the president of a major American public research university. I think there would probably be a lot of outrage over a story like that. I think there would be headlines about unchecked corporate power and overreach in Silicon Valley. And I think journalists would begin reporting on whether or not the president of this hypothetical university might have um, done things, made decisions, or crafted policy that was more in favor of Google's interests than, than the interests of his faculty or his students. Uh, after all, this hypothetical university has some very lucrative business dealings with Google in this imaginary scenario. Now we're going to imagine something even more concerning. The university president that we're imagining runs a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to funding research to find a cure for a disease that has already killed two of his daughters and that uh, will kill he's told by doctors, will kill his, his, his last living daughter. And it turns out this, the CEO of Google has been secretly giving money to this nonprofit directly, sometimes $1 million a year, sometimes $2 million a year, directly towards this nonprofit organization that is doing good work, but that is directly benefiting the president of this university in a, in a very personal capacity. These uh, financial gifts are secret, even though the university uh, president is in charge of a public institution, and even though he is supposed to be, uh, even though his dealings are supposed to be open to public scrutiny. And now the most alarming part of all, a member of this university president's own family, uh, uh, sorry, household, a member of this university uh, president's household has come forward and said that this public servant once took sides against his own student body and his own faculty simply because the CEO that was giving all this money to his nonprofit organization said the flow of funds would stop if he didn't uh, put an end to these protests on campus which were aimed at uh, highlighting his company's poor human rights record overseas. This is the part where we can stop relying on our imagination because the company was not Google, but Nike. The university was not hypothetical. It was the University of Oregon. The university president was a man named Dave Fronmeyer, a former attorney general of Oregon, whose face you might recognize if you watched the, uh, the documentary Wild Wild Country on, on Netflix. Um, and all of this really happened. And it began unfolding about two decades ago, two and a half decades ago, after Oregonians passed a really crippling piece of legislation called Ballot Measure 5, which was aimed at slashing property taxes, which up until that point had, had done most of the heavy lifting in terms of funding public education in Oregon. This pitted K through 12 education, public K through 12 education against uh, public higher education in Oregon and it led Dave Fronmeyer and the University of Oregon to go looking for private funds, outside money as he called it, uh, in order to fund the university that he ran. And in this case, the, the, the donor that he courted was Nike uh, and its CEO, Phil Knight, who was the most illustrious and successful alum of the University of Oregon. So outside of Silicon Valley, and I suppose outside of here in Kirkland, um, a lot of fun has been had over Google's old slogan, don't be evil. But I think it's interesting to consider why a corporation founded in 1998 might have felt the need for such a mantra in the first place. One possible explanation, I would argue, might be suggested by the passage from my book that I'm about to read, which explains a bit about Nike's reputation at the time.
The shoes that Wen T. Tu Fuang died making were designed at Nike's headquarters in Beaverton, Oregon. The plans for the shoes were then relayed by satellite to a computer-aided manufacturing desk in Taiwan, where prototypes were developed and tested. Once the shoes' blueprints were approved, they were sent by fax to the factory where Fuang worked in Bien Hoa, northeast of Ho Chi Minh City. There, the shoes' three main parts, the outsole, the midsole, and the upper, were produced individually, then assembled in a labor-intensive process that was difficult to automate and therefore relied on manual labor. It was a summer day in 1997, and Fuang was making midsoles, carefully trimming away the excess synthetic material overflowing from molds that had just come out of an oven. Nearby, a co-worker's sewing machine suddenly broke down, spraying metal parts across the factory floor. A piece of shrapnel pierced Huang's heart, killing her instantly. She was 23. Nike's response to the young woman's death was to boldly claim, we don't make shoes. Knight and his team of self-proclaimed shoe dogs, whose origin story was tied to making prototype soles in Bill Bowerman's waffle iron, now claimed they were little more than the designers and marketers of shoes made by other companies. The backlash against Nike amplified just as the company was expanding its retail operations by opening its upscale Nike Town retail outlets around the country. Picketers and news cameras showed up at store openings, including one in San Francisco, where NFL wide receiver Jerry Rice was assailed with questions about sweatshops and child labor. This was a major problem for Knight, who planned to open three more Nike Town shops in 1998. They weren't just retail outlets, but brand awareness generators that helped increase Nike sales at other retailers, like Foot Locker. And key Nike Town locations, like the one in London, would help give the company the foothold it needed as it sought to make inroads into the European soccer market. Michael Jordan faced his own tough questions about Nike sweatshops during a press conference, but even worse things were in store for Knight, who learned that documentary filmmaker Michael Moore was set to release a new film, the big one, focused on Nike's misadventures in offshore manufacturing. Wall Street took notice, and throughout 1997, it was not uncommon to find stock analyst reports filled with summaries of the latest news reports on the condition of Nike's factories throughout Asia and the extent to which the company and its shareholders were exposed. For the first time in years, analysts began downgrading Nike's stock and lowering its expectations for the company's outlook. When Knight at last looked outside his company for help, he turned to a, fir a firm called Goodworks International, owned by Andrew Young, a former mayor of Atlanta who had also been the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. He hired Goodworks to evaluate Nike's operations in 1997, and Young himself went to Asia to meet with some of Nike's suppliers and contractors there. When Young issued his report on Nike's use of overseas labor, it was hard to imagine that Dusty Kidd and the rest of Nike's public relations staff could have done more to polish what was clearly a rotten apple. Knight was so pleased with Young's conclusions that he took out a full-page newspaper ad advertisements highlighting them. It is my sincere belief that Nike is doing a good job, one advertisement in the New York Times read, but Nike can and should do better. Knight was also pleased with another aspect of Young's evaluation. While third-party monitoring of Nike's overseas factories was a good idea, it should be left to a company like his own firm, Goodworks, Young felt, and not to global labor and human rights organizations. The benefits of this approach for Nike were evident from the amount of control the company was able to exert over the Young Report, which completely ignored the key issues of wages for factory workers. Young had also relied entirely on Nike interpreters during his 10 days of interviews with the workers making Nike shoes at factories in Asia. The widely criticized Andrew Young report was further undermined in November 1997 when a disgruntled Nike employee leaked some highlights from a series of formal audits Nike had commissioned Ernst & Young to prepare. The accounting firm had, in fact, been auditing Nike factories in Indonesia since 1994, but Knight had managed to keep these less forgiving assessments quiet up until the November 1997 leak of an Ernst & Young report recommending improvements to a factory just north of Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. The factory where Nguyen T. Tu Phuong died making sh Nike shoes, Ernst & Young found, did not have uh, safety equipment or training for its workers, who were forced to work more hours than allowed by law, making them more likely to become injured or killed on the job. 
For months, Nike had known exactly which measures needed to be taken to prevent others from dying like Fuang had. But instead of focusing on solutions for the problems Ernst & Young had found at its factories in Asia, Nike instead promoted the much rosier portrait that Andrew Young had painted in his report, which was conducted the same summer that Fuang died. A picture of a company doing its best and coming up a little short, as even the best athletes sometimes do. A story rather than a, rather than a solution, or as Jordan might say, a dream to be sold rather than a problem to be fixed. And uh, from here I'm going to shift into a passage that describes this burgeoning campus protest movement that was, that was developing at the time uh, that was centered around anti-sweatshop labor. The anti-sweatshop labor movement is sort of hard to imagine now. I mean, we're seeing a resurgence in campus protest movements now, I think, surrounded, centered on things like the NRA, uh, sort of, uh, you know, Me Too issues like this. We're seeing a return to to campus protest. Uh, but um, for a long time, basically since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan started, campus protest has been largely about anti-war because we basically been at war ever since. But prior to that, this, um, this anti-sweatshop movement was, was, a, was a big deal, and it was, in fact, maybe the most successful uh, mass protest movement in America since, um, since the anti-apartheid movement. And here's what it looked like at the University of Oregon. On the afternoon of April 4, 2000, six University of Oregon students locked arms and blocked the entrance to Johnson Hall a stately 100-year-old building that housed the offices of the school's top administrators. A heaving mass of protesters came with them, swarming the six stone columns framing the entrance to the red brick facade, which sits on 295 immaculately, immaculately kept acres of campus, bordered by the Willamette River and stippled with some 3,000 trees. From the window of his office, Dave Fronmeyer could see the messages students had written to him, spelled out on the sidewalk in bright pink chalk. Take a hike, Nike, with the company's signature swoosh logo standing in for its name. It was the University of Oregon's first major student sit-in since the anti-war demonstrations that began in 1969 and carried on into the following year when four members of a self-described student women's militia hurled buckets of fresh animal blood on army recruiters while chanting slogans of protest against the My Lai massacre in Vietnam. Oregon's campus protests against the war in Vietnam intensified just as Fronmeyer arrived at the university as a law professor and legal counsel to then President Robert D. Clark. In many ways, Clark had it easier than Fronmeyer. Had he sided with protesters and kicked recruiters off his campus, he'd only have angered the U.S. Army. Fronmeyer, on the other hand, had to worry about angering Phil Knight. In the three decades since Fronmeyer had moved to Eugene, the college by the river had grown to become Eugene's largest employer, with 10,000 Oregonians depending on the school for their livelihood. And in the handful of years since Knight had begun paying for new buildings on campus, he'd become more than just an important booster for Oregon athletics. He was the school's most important benefactor, which made him, in a sense, the town's most important benefactor. On campus, not everyone was comfortable with the influence Knight seemed to have or the school's renewed focus on athletics over academics. These developments coincided with the moment in which student activism was regaining its voice, particularly when it came to labor and human rights issues. And Nike, which was facing intensifying calls for independent monitoring at its overseas factories, had a target on its back. It was a major problem for Knight's company, which was losing ground to Adidas and couldn't afford to give up its position as the shoe and apparel supplier to America's top universities. Nike's war to maintain its grip on America's college campuses began in earnest in late 1997 when students at the University of North Carolina protested the company's $7.2 million endorsement deal with the school. In early 1998, the movement gained a powerful voice in Jim Keady, an assistant soccer coach at St. John's University who decided to publicly quit his job rather than wear the Nike gear his school's contract demanded. I don't want to be a billboard for a company that would do these things, Keedy said of Nike's overseas labor practices. In 1999, the pressure on Nike intensified after student activists took over buildings at Duke, Georgetown, the University of Michigan, and the University of Wisconsin, and staged sit-ins at many other schools. Just before Christmas in 2000, student carolers strode through the halls of Harvard University's administrative building, singing away in a sweatshop. It was becoming more than just an image problem for Nike. 
When a factory worker was fired by one of Nike's contractors in Honduras, student activists organized such effective protests that the company was forced to rehire the woman. Nike's university shoe and apparel contracts became the common battleground shared by activists concerned over issues ranging from sweatshop labor and China trade policy to college athletics, which increasingly took precedence over academic excellence at schools around the country. And it wasn't just contracts with athletics departments that were under fire. Nike was facing significant bash backlash over the brand and apparel it had so successfully marketed to ordinary university students through its College Colors program. It really is quite sick, said Tom Wheatley, a student and organizer at the University of Wisconsin. 14-year-old girls are working 100-hour weeks and earning poverty-level wages to make my college t-shirts. That's unconscionable. At a growing number of campuses around the country, organizations like United Students Against Sweatshops and the Movement for Democracy in Education collaborated with the National Labor Committee and the Worker Rights Consortium. The student-led WRC proved to be especially effective at recruiting universities to the cause, first by protesting and then by lobbying students, faculty, and university presidents to sign its pledge censuring corporations for using sweatshop labor to produce athletic apparel and shoes. By April 2000, the months old organization had already gained the backing of 45 different universities around the country, which frustrated and angered Knight because joining the WRC meant publicly criticizing Nike for failing to allow, among other things, surprise inspections at its overseas factories where its shoes were made. Knight, meanwhile, was trying to pressure Nike's partner schools into ignoring the WRC, steering them toward the relatively toothless Fair Labor Association, which had executives from various apparel companies sitting on its board. The campus wars came to a head in April of 2000 when Knight abruptly ended negotiations to renew his company's sports equipment contract with the University of Michigan, a deal that would have been as wor worth as much as $26 million, making it the largest of its kind up until that point. Michigan's administrators and athletics departments stood firm, issuing an unusually pointed statement aimed at Nike's retaliatory tactics. Nike has chosen to strike out at universities committed to finding appropriate ways to safeguard and respect human rights, the school said. And uh, I'll stop that section there. This basically leads up to the situation that I described at, at the beginning of my talk, which I think you can infer from what I've said so far how that situation turns out and uh, who comes out uh, the victor when when students or faculty or even administrators go up against a big time corporate benefactor like Phil Knight. Uh, but I want to talk uh, briefly before opening it up to questions from you guys about uh, how the book came to be in the first place and sort of the ground that it covers uh, because um, because it, it didn't it didn't start out as, as, a, as a book. It actually began in the spring of 2014 as just a couple of news, uh, newspaper articles for the New York Times. I, the, the, the sports editor for the New York Times, a guy named Jason Stallman, sent me to Eugene to cover this scandal that was unfolding there at the University of Oregon where a freshman had uh, reported that she had been raped by three of the school's basketball players. and. Um, it was unusual and, and worth the coverage, I thought, because uh, the, the reason I heard about it in the first place was because of a police report that, that had been leaked to the press. And the police report was two months old. And I thought, you know, why, why is this, why are these guys still playing basketball, first of all? I mean, why, why haven't we heard anything about this yet? Uh, and the reason it turned out was because the school had chosen to treat uh, this girl's report of being sexually assaulted rather brutally, I might add. It was a very graphic police report. Um, uh, they decided to treat this like a public relations issue rather than a serious uh, legal and, and uh, ethical and moral issue. And so um, I was left with a lot of questions uh, by the way, the school handled this this case. You know, I, the, 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 in the end, they uh, in the end they suspended the players. The players all went off to other universities, and uh, the university president resigned in in shame. Took with him nearly a million dollars in severance pay. Uh, 
And, you know, meanwhile, the student, as I followed the case for years, I ended up going off to Columbia Journalism School uh, later that year, uh, where I was an, uh, a fellow at the Stabile Center for Investigative Journalism, and I chose to, to follow this as my master's project there. And um, as I followed along with what happened, things just got worse and worse for the, for the victim in this case, for the woman who, who filed this, uh, this report. I mean, the school really treated this girl uh, very badly. They, one administrator encouraged her to, to uh, seek counseling. You know, they, they gave all these interviews in the press after the story broke about how they have all these resources for, for students and counseling available. So then this, this girl who filed this report and who had it ignored while, while the school allowed these guys to keep playing basketball through the NCAA tournament. Uh, and uh, after she went to counseling, uh, the, the, the person in charge of the student counseling center, who herself was a, a licensed psychologist, um, instructed her subordinates to, to steal the, the notes from her sessions, from her therapy sessions, so that they could use them against her in the event of a lawsuit. And eventually they ended up uh, settling the whole thing out of court. Uh, but, you know, I learned that stuff like this goes on, and, and it's, not, it's not rare. It happens, it happens everywhere, and as I argue in the book, it's really compounded when, when universities have corporate partners like Nike and they become more concerned with protecting their brand than they do with following the rules, following, I mean, in this case alone, uh, state public records laws were broken. Uh, I think some federal laws regarding Title IX and regarding uh, the Clary Act were also violated, I argue. Um, and so that's, that's sort of how I came to, to work on this book. And um, what I learned as I looked back is that the story is one that we should all be paying attention to no matter what state we live in because uh, this, you know, I, I thought I was writing, I told a guy at the New York Times in an interview, I thought I, was, I thought I was writing a book about something that happened at the University of Oregon and instead what, I, what it turned out I was writing was a book about something that's happening everywhere because this all began for Oregonians back in, 1990, when they passed this this piece of legislation that defunded uh, public higher education and sent people, uh, sent university presidents and administrators scrambling, looking for outside money, uh, but it didn't stop with Oregon. Oregon was just ahead of the curve, and and so Oregon started doing that in 1990, and a few years later, states are doing it everywhere, and so now everyone is, uh, I mean, and. Believe it or not, as horrible as this all sounds, this seems attractive to a lot of university administrators because university presidents uh, tend to be very short-term in their thinking. They're around usually for four or five years, and the blueprint for them is to sort of uh, come in, build something, and put their name on it or have their name associated with it, and then move on to another university and a bigger paycheck. And... Um, so for them, uh, I describe in the book, for example, the University of Maryland, where um, Kevin Plank, the uh, founder of Under Armour, is an alum. I mean, they basically look at this as a, as a, as a blueprint, as a road to follow. Yeah, this is great because it uh, will allow us to build some fancy new buildings on campus. And uh, meanwhile, student tuition still goes up because... When you have a big-time corporate donor like Phil Knight at your school, it's really the equivalent of having a credit card with a limit that you, that you just shouldn't have. It allows, it allows universities to, to spend well beyond their means, and they spend on the things that those donors want, like a big stadium or, or what have you. And what those donors tend not to care about is academics, is, uh, well, one of the things that makes... Uh, that makes the American public university such, a, such a, a great idea and so good for society is that it's always been a path for lower and middle class people to, to, to work their way up. Uh, I mean, my, my mother worked in a cannery and my father was a fisherman and I grew up in a tiny town in Alaska and, you know, it's because of public, a public state, you know, university, it's because of that access to an affordable degree that I was able to work my way up and, and get, get where I wanted to go. So um, 
this is not just uh, this is no sm small thing that's imperiled when we when we abandon a public institution like this to uh, a, a, to corporate interests and and allow them to to call the shots because what we're abandoning is not just an important public institution but an institution that really provides in a way that nothing else can, I would argue, a path to upward social mobility. And so, um, again, as I told uh, this guy at the New York Times who interviewed me, you know, why should people read this book? I told him, well, I think now is the perfect time for Americans to understand, to, to, to fully understand the consequences of abandoning our public institutions and uh, in order to save a few dollars on our taxes and uh, leaving them up to you know private interests to to come in and save them because that's what will happen I mean uh, these you know institutions aren't just going to fade away other you know if, if we are if we as citizens aren't interested other interests will come in and will take over and will steer the ship and uh, we're seeing in our government what what that's what that's like right now uh, but this is a very uh, in-depth case study of what that looks like over time and of how that really infects every aspect of the institution. And uh, I guess now I will start taking some questions if you guys have any. So to repeat the question, uh, how can, uh, how can uh, students, how, how can st students who are protesting on their campuses be more effective and have an impact when, when uh, universities and their benefactors are, are sort of trying to manage them, I guess. Uh, and it's interesting, one of the things, I mean, I think uh, one of the reasons why I talk uh, for a few chapters about the importance of this anti-sweatshop protest movement is because um, I think there's a lot of really valuable lessons there, and there's some important history there, too. One of the valuable lessons is that protesting really works. I mean, uh, Nike's, I mean, I'm not going to go out there and, and say Nike is doing everything they should be doing when it comes to overseas labor at this point, but they're doing a lot better. And they didn't, do, they didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, we have a moral obligation to these people that are dying in Vietnam or wherever making our shoes. They did it because... The protesters were just so were, were were organizing so effectively, and uh, part of the part of the reason they were so effective is because there was a lot of collaboration. So you had um, it was inter I mean there was human rights groups on in an international human rights groups collaborating with American labor and union groups, collaborating with uh, church groups. I mean there were some cases back then where you had outright communists organizing with, you know, old church ladies, which is fascinating to think about. I mean, you can really accomplish things when you can bring together, you know, old church ladies and communists. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that's really effective organization. And it, it I, would, I argue also in the book that they were so, the network they built up was so strong that when the wind shifted and suddenly everyone started protesting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, part of the reason those protests came together so quickly is because there were already these sort of radical left-wing networks at all these campuses, people who were, who were on the same page politically. And um, so even though the, I mean, you might say, well, we're still at war, so what did those protests do? But they got attention, and uh, they were big, and uh, people's voices were heard. Um, Today, actually, you know, some reviewers who have read the book and who have interviewed me have said it's kind of a it's kind of a dark book. You know, do you do you think uh, is are, are you hopeful? You know, you talk about all this bad stuff that goes on. Do you have any reason for hope? And I tell them one thing that makes me hopeful is um, this resurgence in the campus protest movement and the fact that there is there does seem to be this spirit of collaboration out there where there's people. People whose issue is uh, uh, gun control, uh, collaborating with uh, people mm -hmm. whose issue is, um, you know, raising the minimum wage or whatever, or whether it's Me Too or whether it's 
sort of just anti-Trump generally. But there's a, there seems to be a lot of collaboration. And um, I think the protests against the NRA are especially inspiring because that's something that for years we've heard people say, oh, well, I mean, basically the left threw in the towel on that issue saying it was impossible, a non-starter. And all of a sudden there's these like 18 and 19 year olds really making the NRA sweat and like really pushing people. And I get emails all the time from different chapters of the Democratic Socialists of America saying like, oh, we'd love to have you for an event or whatever. That tells me there's all these young people out there who, who are deeply committed to change and willing to fight for it. And they don't, they don't have these same lines in the sand that we used to, where we thought, oh, well, that's, that's too much to ask for, so we just won't ask for it. They're asking for, I mean, they're asking for socialism, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> that's, that's like something that no one would have thought to seriously ask for a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, um, are there processes or systems that universities can can have to prevent uh, against these, the kinds of abuses that I describe in the book, uh, you know, some sort of systemic ways of, of dealing with the problem of uh, overreach by corporate donors at universities. I think there's a, a few things. The sort of biggest picture thing is more of a, a it's, it's, you know, a government slash society thing, not a university thing. And that is that um, in addition to we as, as citizens recognizing the value of our un public universities and, and, and supporting them however we can uh, with our taxes or what have you, I think also we should make sure that our corporations are paying their fair share of taxes. And so if uh, a corporation does need, to support, um, does need to support a university, it can do so with its tax dollars in a way that's transparent uh, and that doesn't lead to these kind of private fiefdoms that we see uh, with Nike and the University of Oregon or Under Armour and uh, University of Maryland or in Oklahoma with T. Boone Pickens, the oil billionaire. Um, the other thing is uh, a lot of what I describe in the book are abuses of processes that already are in place. And so, uh, for instance, um, public records law in Oregon is pretty strong and uh, it really demands that the public uh, be able to scrutinize. I mean, any public university, any university that gets federal funding, the, the records are public. Basically, every record created at that university is public unless it infringes on a, on a student's privacy or someone's you know, uh, medical privacy or personal privacy or something like this. So for instance, uh, when, a student, uh, when a student reports a rape, if university administrators start talking about that on email or text messages on their work phones with crisis communicators and PR professionals and saying, how do we handle this? Um, or the day that uh, the police report of a, of a rape on campus leaks and they start passing emails back and forth uh, saying, oh my God, what are we going to do? Um, those are public records. Those are records I tried to get and that they really fought to hide because uh, because those records revealed that they were not thinking about the victim. They were not thinking about the student body. They were thinking about their image and their brand and their paychecks, basically. And um, so one thing is to, um, to make sure that we have strong enforcement for things like open records laws and to really demand that these people follow the rules and to demand that they, uh, I mean, not just the rules, but the law, respect the processes that are in place because transparency is the, the biggest thing that we can have. I mean, someone at a luncheon recently said, you know, this is why integrity and leadership matters so much. And I said, no, I disagree. Integrity is, is a gamble. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's a gamble to, to bet on your, your CEO having integrity. And everyone's fallible also. So even people of integrity uh, can be compromised. What's important is transparency and accountability. Follow-up question, uh, big philanthropy, should there be more oversight? Yes, it's, 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 uh, it's tricky though because um, I think if there were more oversight, I mean, I think yes, there should be more oversight, there should be more accountability. Uh, but I also 
I think we'll see how generous people really are when there's when there's actual accountability and when this stuff is all out in the open. Because, um, and again, it goes back to that tax issue. Just make corporations pay their taxes because all this valorizing of billionaires giving uh, money away, I mean, mostly it's a tax write-off for them. Um, and mostly their money comes with uh, strings attached, as, I mean, it certainly does in the case of, cases that I describe in my in my book. So it's a tricky question. It's a tricky question. Yes, we should, but what will happen to the philanthropy industry? Because it is an industry and it is kind of, I describe it in my book not as, as gifts, but as in investments. I mean, I think that's how people, I think that's how philanthropy really works, is it's a kind of investment. The question is these students as, regarding these students as employees movement, this endless controversy about whether student athletes ought to be paid uh, or not paid. Uh, you know, I describe uh, in my book, at some point, I describe how that came to pass. And um, basically, let me, yeah, in fact, I'll just read this brief passage about the first uh, sort of rule book for, for college football. Um, and it was decided, these were decided on in 1860, uh, so, sorry, 1869 was the, this uh, important game when Rutgers beat Princeton that sort of led to the the flowering of college football. And then uh, in 1898, in February 1898, Brown University hosted a, a conference focused on, quote, the discussion of questions arising out of intercollegiate contests and the objectionable features connected with them, end quote, which drew delegates from Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, Princeton, and the University of Pennsylvania. These delegates argued on a set of eligibility requirements known as the Providence Rules, and they advanced an idea that remains among the most enduring and controversial aspects of college sports. It is obvious, they wrote in their report, that no student should be paid for his athletics. Okay, so let me just read again the name of the colleges that decided that it would be ungentlemanly to pay athletes, uh, student athletes, for uh, their work on behalf of the school. Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, Princeton, and the University of Pennsylvania. This is, this is uh, you know, a turn of the century uh, uh, Ivy League uh, thing. I mean, and you know, they were very. There was this obsession with what they called the athlete's code of honor. And the really funny thing is, it. Uh, well, I'll just read on. After the passage, it is obvious that no student should be paid for his athletics, I say, <clears throat> market forces prevailed, however, giving college football its first cheating scandal just one year after the Brown Conference gave it a rule book. Desperate to beat rival school Yale, and unable to find 11 men of weight and muscle among its, his university's 2,100 male students, Columbia's head football coach, George Foster Sanford, resorted to hiring ringers. The university tried to pin the scandal on a departing assistant coach, but years later, Sanford would blame, blame his unprecedented $5,000 coaching salary. The lure of quick money, the unexpected pressure that came with it, and, quote, the virus of the game, he said, had nearly destroyed him. I mean, I think, has anything changed? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the, 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 that's sort of what happens when you have something, you know, this institution where the stakes are so high and, the, and there's so much money pouring into it and everyone is getting paid but the students, of course there's going to be corruption. Of course there's going to be scandal. I mean, this, uh, this, this corruption, I mean, it, it's laughable that, that, that the only thing these people are getting convicted of now is you know, paying athletes. I mean, that's, that, seems, that seems silly to me. Um, it seems... In short, it seems to me that this system doesn't work. It's, it's at best deeply hypocritical and, and highly unrealistic. It's going to be rife with corruption and crime if it goes on this way. 
they should probably change the rule book. And by the way, the, it's not like the NCAA has ever changed a rule before. One thing I discuss in the book is the whole reason that Nike and Adidas and these other shoe and apparel companies can make all school deals with, uh, with universities is because Nike did an end run around the rules back, back in the day, back in the late 70s. Up until 1986, there was no such provision for having an all school deal. So um, what they did was Nike realized, oh, we just buy the coaches. Uh, so they would go directly to the coach, pay the coach five or ten thousand dollars, and say, "We're going to pay you. We're going to give you, Mr. Basketball Coach, uh, a, a contract. We'll pay you five or ten thousand dollars a year, and you're going to exclusively wear Nike shoes. And uh, by the way, we're also going to give you a free pair of shoes for how many guys do you have on your team? Okay, that many guys." And if you let us know what sizes to, to get them in, we'll, we'll make sure they're the right size for the guys. No, uh, and and uh, if all goes well, we'll give you the same amount of money next year, too, and, and the year after that in perpetuity. And it's like a quarter of what the coaches, I mean, the, in the end, they were getting more money from Nike or Adidas, whoever their part, shoe partner was, than they were from their university. And, um, and so that's, by 1986... Uh, you know, I mean, there was, there was, the, they couldn't legally require the coach to to make his players wear the shoes, but if you know that you're not going to get that ten thousand dollars next year unless Nike's happy, and you know what will make Nike happy is to make your players wear the shoes, they're going to wear the shoes, and they did, and so that's why in 1986 the NCAA said, "Screw it, let's just commodify the game and and change the rules," and that's why we have all school deals. They could do something similar uh, to, to, they could change the rules for, you know, in favor of paying players or, or something like this. They, they, just, uh, they just don't have any incentive to do it, or they think they don't have an incentive to do it. So the question is, uh, is there a corporate, uh, is there a corporation that has a relationship with the university that I think is ideal and that is some kind of model? Besides Google, besides Google's, I mean, you know, my book largely focuses on the relationships that haven't that have spectacularly not worked out. I mean, Berkeley and Novartis comes to mind. Berkeley and BP Oil, um, and uh, and of course the big, uh, you know, the uh, the big apparel and shoemakers. Um, I think. Uh, you know, as as a journalist, it's not really my it's not really my place to sort of um, advise on policy or 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 think too much about how things you know ought to be. Uh, but I do think that um, I do maintain that whatever because look, I mean, I I think basically I don't subscribe to this myth of good and bad corporations. I just don't. Uh, and and I really do think that's a myth, and I and I think that corporations that that act appropriately are corporations where power is somewhat evenly distributed, where there's a good corporate culture, where there is incentives to do the right thing as opposed to doing the wrong thing, uh, you know, where where diversity and inclusion are 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 important. And, uh, and where there's transparency. I mean, where there's transparency and, more, and equally important, accountability, where, there, where those things are paramount, I think you just can't go wrong. Uh, because otherwise, you know, the problem isn't just what a corporation might make a university do, might force a university to do. In, in, in Nike's case, I mean, everything from, I mean, Phil Knight has had people hired and fired from, the athletics department at the University of Oregon, which is crazy. Uh, but um, it's also about what universities, you know, might think their corporate benefactor would want them to do uh, and, and how they might change their behavior without even, you know, without any direct cues from someone that's giving them money. They might just say, oh, well, we don't want this headache, so we'll, we'll act this way or act that way. Uh, that can be really harmful, too. And so... You know, say the corporation is trying, is doing their best to, to do things really ethically. And in the case of this partnership, um, things can still go bad if the university sort of 
thinks they need to cover up this or hide that or make things, you know, if they're worried about spooking the corporate sponsor. So transparency is key. And that's tricky with, uh, so one thing I talk about near the end of the book is um, this thing called the Night Campus for Advancing uh, Scientific Impact, which is, a, to me, a very Silicon Valley sounding sort of, it sounds like an incubator or something at a, at, at the University of Oregon. It's being uh, funded. It's a billion-dollar campus being funded with a $500 million uh, gift from Phil Knight, which is another thing about big-time philanthropy. It's when someone hands you $500 million for a billion-dollar project, they're also handing you a bill for $500 million, and, <laughs> and it's tough to raise that money. And uh, so now the University of Oregon is looking into state bonds and stuff like that to finish the project. And a big concern for me is if they get down to that last 100 billion or 100 million that they need, um, what are you going to be willing to do if you're a university president and you can go out with a big win or, or a big loss, uh, depending on whether you get this campus completed? What are you going to be willing to do for the person that's going to put up that last $100 million? Probably, probably a lot. Um, and you know, when it comes to, it just gets these these issues just get more complex because there's not been any transparency about what kind of corporate partners are going to be uh, involved in doing research at the Knight Campus. But uh, some people, a lot of people, think it's probably going to be pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I mean, it could what you know could be Google or someone doing AI research. Uh, whatever the case may be. There are loopholes in Oregon's public records law which allow people to keep secret communications that might infringe on some kind of trade secret. That's a big problem because, you know, how do you protect, how does a corporation pr legitimately protect their trade secrets without that being abused? I mean, before long, you've got people maybe talking about illegal activities, you know, between some researcher and some pharmaceutical company head. Maybe they're trying to cover up some ill effect that was discovered through some study or something. And they can do it by exploiting this loophole by saying, oh, well, these emails we won't give to journalists or to the public because they might infringe on trade secrets. That's concerning. So again, transparency is the thing. So the question is, where would I rank Phil Knight among all the awful CEOs? <laughs> Again, my answer is uh, maybe a little bit unsexy, but um, I just, uh, I don't, uh, for me, it's not a matter of corporations being evil or good. It's about them being totally amoral, 100% amoral, uh, guided by nothing more than, um, I mean, maybe loosely some founding principle or some, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if it's a corporation that's founded, that's, founded by engineers, then they're more likely to have some, maybe some drive that's, uh, you know, whether they're obsessed with AI or whatever it is, but more or less they're, they're, they're driven by achieving their goal and making a lot of money for their shareholders while, while doing it. Or, uh, or, um, or just making enough money to keep the boat going. I mean, look at Theranos, you know. Uh, so, um, for me, it's it's not really about like oh CEOs are so evil, it's uh, and, and corporations are so bad. It, it's just that they in my to my mind they will all more or less do what they can get away with. Uh, and uh, what I when I say what they can get away with, I mean like within the within their corporate structure, within their society, within you know I mean. Uh, I'm really obs uh, my next book is going to be about global counterfeiting and international crime and that's really connected to the offshore manufacturing boom of the 1980s. And so I'm really obsessed with that right now and I think um it you know one of the things that's interesting about it to me is these companies that are, these multinational corporations that are all victims of uh of counterfeiters now they've created this problem for themselves because they set up their manufacturing in explicitly in countries not only where labor was cheap, but where there were really weak protections for workers, so they could just exploit people to the maximum. Uh, and, you know, places where the rule of law is weak and they could sort of push around the government a little bit. 
I mean, hey, guess what? You can't push around China so easily now as, as you could maybe back in the 1980s if you're some American corporation. And so, uh, Phil, so I hesitate to rank Phil Knight uh, among, uh, among all the other you know, bad guys, CEOs out there. I think uh, I will say one reason I thought this book was especially important to write now is because there's this whole generation, I think, who are growing up um, afraid of Facebook or, you know, afraid of, uh, uh, or they hate Elon Musk. You know, the sort of anti-corporate type of person these days is pretty focused on tech companies. The exposés and all that are mostly about tech companies. And I think it's important to remind people that capitalism has basically always been this way. <laughs> um, and... Uh, the way of protecting civil society from unchecked capitalism is the same ways as it's always been. Yeah? Why do you think universities take this like kind of poison money that has, because like, a lot of times they get these donations that say, if you match half a billion dollars, we'll pay the other half. But they don't have the money, why do they take it, why do they take it in the first place? I mean, the same reason a company would take some venture capital if they're not all the way there, right? They want to keep going. They want to keep going. They don't want the party to end. I mean, maybe they really believe in their idea, or maybe they really believe they can get there. And uh, maybe they don't. Either way, you know, uh, now always seems like a bad time to stop, I think, to people, <laughs> whether you're in tech or whether you're in the university world. Um, in the case of university administrators and in the University of Oregon, in, in the case of the University of Oregon in particular, they've been bailed out so many times by taxpayers that I think they're just used to, oh, we'll get the money from, from the taxpayers if we need to. They, they uh, basically, they'll, whatever, whatever Phil Knight doesn't pay for and whatever they can't get other donors to shore up the money for, which is hard, by the way, because if you've got to raise $500 million for something called the Knight Campus, I mean, it, no one else is getting their name on there. I mean, uh, th there's, there's less of an incentive for people to give big money, big dollar gifts to a project like that, unless they have a specific research interest or something. And so what they do is the, the president of the University of Oregon, Michael Schill, is already begging the legislature in Oregon to issue these state bonds, which come with hefty interest payments. And they, they, that's, that's basically their answer is, oh, give us $100 million more in state bonds, please. And the legislature has so far been fairly skeptical of, I mean, they've given them some of the money they've asked for, but not all of it. So, again, the question for me becomes, when it comes down to the point where they need to raise that last $200 million, $100 million, what are they going to be willing to do? I, I fear to find out what the answer is. Or, at the very least, I hope we find out what the answer is, fearful as it may be. Thank you, Josh.